We're going to start to start with oscillations, which is one of the most useful subjects in physics because much of physics deals with oscillations, where you're um, looking at a system which is in equilibrium or near equilibrium, and it moves slightly um, from that position. So we're going to start with describing the motion of a mass on a spring. And when we talk about this, we are largely talking, well, we will start with a concrete picture, and then later I'm going to tell you why this is generalizable, and it's more applicable to, to it's applicable to a large number of problems. So, um, for instance, if you have, we'll start with the mass on sideways, so you have a wall here, and a frictionless table, a spring here, and you put a mass M right here, and um, we will call this, we will center our coordinate system around the equilibrium position. That's very important because sometimes when you get into the math of this, you tend to forget what the definition of the origin is, and the definition of the origin changes everything. So we are, unless I say otherwise, we are going to put our origin here, so this is the x-axis, and we mostly are not dealing with displacements in y, um, and the z origin is at the equilibrium position. Now, we pull the mass slightly away from the equilibrium position, and the force experienced is negative kx, where k is called the spring constant, and x is the displacement from the equilibrium position. Now, if I had defined my origin slightly off from the equilibrium position, this would have, a, this would potentially have an offset like this. For now, to keep the math simple, we are going to define, to keep the origin defined as um, the equilibrium position so we don't have to have those correction terms, um, makes life easier. So if I pull my mass slightly from equilibrium, it is going to um, experience a force pushing it back. The negative sign here indicates that, uh, that this is your displacement from equilibrium. So if you pull uh, the, met the spring in the positive x direction, then the force is in the negative x direction. If you pull the spring, if you pull the mass in the negative x direction, the force is in the positive x direction. So that the force always pulls the mass back towards its equilibrium position. Um, and then we can talk about what, what the, uh, if you want to draw the full um, free body diagram, you have the spring force, you have the normal force, and you have the weight. Um, in this case, we are considering a frictionless table, so you do not have, um, so you don't have any other forces. Now, if we consider the math exactly here at equilibrium, let me make sure I got my colors right. So here, when the mass is at equilibrium, we only have the normal force and weight. Here, if I pull the mass over here, now I have normal force, weight, and the restoring force from the spring. I push my mass over here so that I am compressing the spring. Now I still have normal force, weight, and now the restoring force from the spring points in the positive x direction. So these are my um, free body diagrams in the different cases. Um, so that depending on where you are, the, the mass experiences different, um, a, a different um, restoring force. So, and then this is the same picture. If I pull it here and I displace it um, by, so that the amplitude is plus A, what's going to happen is that my mass is going to, if I start here, it is going to ac accelerate till it reaches the, the center. And then once it reaches the center, it, you're, it's going to start compressing the spring 
until it reaches negative A. And now it experiences a restoring force in the opposite direction. And it goes back towards the center until it stretches out to positive A and bounces back. So this is what we mean by oscillatory behavior. The mass oscillates between positive A and negative A. And if you look at, um, if you look at what the spring is doing at different times, so this figure here shows uh, the spring and the displacement of the mass at different times. So up here, you are at the, you are as far, the spring is as stretched as it is going to be. And therefore, it experiences a restoring force in this direction, always pushing it back towards the center line. I'm gonna draw that, I'm gonna highlight that center line right with a bright yellow line. So we're always trying to end up back here. When we are here, there's a force here. It's the largest displacement, so the largest force in that direction. We accelerate, we reach here. There is no, um, there is no restoring force here because it's exactly at equilibrium, but it still has some kinetic energy, so it's gonna keep pushing on this way until the spring compresses. Now the, the force is maximum in that direction and the mass receives a push this way until it reaches the maximum here. And now it only, it experiences a force this direction. Um, so the force is in different, um, points in different directions and has different magnitudes depending on where you are in that cycle. So if you look at the position as a function of time, um, and here we're assuming that you have started at uh, an amplitude A, it's going to oscillate back and forth. Uh, so you will see a sinusoidal wave pattern, um, meaning that it can be described by either a sine or a cosine. And if you measure this in a lab, and you will at some point measure this in a laboratory, um, you will, uh, if you displace this, the, the mass, you're going to observe some oscillation. Now note here, the data don't start when you have your maximum displacement, so the, the off, there's some offset, but you observe this sinusoidal pattern. Now, you also see that there's a slight decrease in amplitude with time, that's normal. Um, we'll talk about why that happens in real data, but for now we're dealing with imaginary frictionless systems. So we can talk about the form of that displacement, and we're going to use this form uh, with A is some constant, meaning the displacement. Cosine, um, we have a choice between sine and cosine. They're, they both will work, but your book uses cosine as the convention. Um, and so we'll stick with cosine because it's an arbitrary choice. Omega two, or sorry, omega t. The omega gives you the angular frequency, and then t is the time, and phi is the phase shift. So this is the functional form. It turns out that you can actually describe any displacement uh, like that. So if I wanted to use a cosine instead, I could write it as x of t equals the a would be the same sine the omega would be the same, and then I would just have a different phase shift. So um, we have special words for each of these variables. A is the amplitude. Omega is the angular frequency. My handwriting is terrible. Um, T is the time, phi is the phase shift. Now, I chose this form. You could use a sign. You also could choose to write it as A cosine omega T plus B sine omega T. There will be times that I would use that form instead. Um, Remember my mantra, a good physicist is a lazy physicist. Sometimes this is the more useful form, 
and I'm going to choose whatever one means that I don't have to work any harder than I have to. And now we're going to talk about how you take physics problems and that functional equation and use that to write down to describe, describe the motion of the mass on a spring. Here are some other useful equations. Uh, I am generally not for gratuitous memorization. You know when a physicist memorizes something, you probably can't avoid it. These are equations that it is large, well, the, the latter three are largely worth memorizing, even if you don't like memorizing. T is called the period. Um, the period is equal to one over the frequency. The frequency is related to the angular frequency. We've run into the angular frequency and the frequency before um, when, when we talked about circular motion. And omega, so here's two different forms for omega. Uh, for specifically uh, a mass on a spring, omega is equal to the square root of the spring constant divided by the, uh, the mass. The equations for the angular frequency and the period are universal um, whenever you're talking about oscillatory motion. Those just follow from the definitions of the period, the frequency, and the angular frequency. All right, I am going to do a little bit of differential equations. Uh, I think that if you are, if you already have taken calculus, you're going to be able to follow this. If you can't, it's okay to ignore it. So our force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. I am going to introduce the notation where the derivative of x with respect to t, I am going to call x with a dot on top of it. And that means that the second derivative of x with respect to t is x double dot. Now, force equals mass times acceleration, which is equal to negative kx squared. So I can write this mx double dot equals negative kx. I can further rearrange this m x double dot plus k x equals zero or x double dot plus k over m equals x or sorry sorry x double dot plus k over m x equals zero this is a second order differential equation the second order means that the highest order of derivative, derivative that we have is a second order derivative, x double dot. We have a second, derivative, second order derivative. Um, and it is a differential equation, meaning that it is an equation relating the derivatives and the, uh, fu the function itself to each other. Um, so if we want to talk about the motion of a mass on a spring, we need to solve this equation. So how are we going to solve this? There's a few different ways. Um, the easiest way is to use a test solution. And I'm going to, just, I'm going to do this two different ways. Um, first of all, we're going to use a test solution of, suggestively, a cosine omega t plus phi. Um, and then, the first derivative is negative a omega sine omega t plus phi. And the second derivative is equal to negative a omega squared cosine omega t plus phi which means that I can write the second derivative as negative omega squared x because x is a cosine squared or a, a cosine omega t plus phi. 
And when we look here at this equation, we are looking for something, we are looking for a function x, um, which is proportional to its second derivative. So here, I have a function x which is proportional to its second derivative. You could plug in the whole function here. I like putting the x in here because a good physicist is a lazy physicist. I know it's going to make fewer lines of algebra for me later. So I am going to take this and plug this in here. And I get that negative omega squared x plus k over m x equals 0. <clears throat> and when I do this, um, now I have a trivial solution, which is that x equals 0. That's not interesting because that means that yeah, this is true. If, it, if the mass just stays at the same place the, uh, all, over all time. It's true, but it's not interesting. Um, the other solution that I have is this one, um, where negative omega, I'm going to divide by x, um, so my x's cancel out, and I am left with omega squared plus k over m equals 0, or omega squared equals k over m or omega equals the square root of k over m. So for a mass on a spring, it oscillates. It, it can be described by this equation. And, um, and it oscillates with an angular frequency of the square root of k over m. And when you get on to differential equations, you will actually talk about how this is a complete solution. So all possible solutions of this equation you can describe as a cosine omega t plus phi with some a and some phi. I have simply left these as constants. All right. I'm going to use a different test solution here and show you that that, in fact, works as well. Uh, here I am going to use the solution x of t equals a e to the negative mm, i b t. We're just going to leave it as b. So the a and b are some constants. And here, i is equal to the square root of negative 1. Now, if this is over your head, feel free to pass on by this point. I'm doing this for an honors class. Some of you guys are going to follow. Some of you guys are going to love it. If you're not following, move on to the next section. OK, then the first derivative is negative i b a e to the negative i b t. And my second derivative is equal to negative i squared. Now, i squared is negative 1. So I get a negative 1 from that. And I get, a, and then times the, the negative sign is a positive b squared a e to the negative, let's see, did I? I, ah, I have a negative i times negative i. Let me just leave, multiply this out. So I have negative i times negative i b squared a e to the negative i b t. This is equal to negative 1 because negative one, I have negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1. So this is negative b squared a e to the negative i b t. And that is simply equal to negative b squared x. Now I can plug this in here. And I get negative b squared x plus k over m x equals 0. 
And following the same logic as before, I get that B equals the square root of K over M. Now, my choice of a negative sign here was arbitrary, and I actually could have chosen a positive sign. And if I had done that, that actually would have ended up always giving me a negative sign here. So if I had, if I consider both options, now with the plus or minus signs, I let them both happen, I still get the same answer. So I get that this is actually a valid solution of that. Now, how do I have imaginary numbers? Euler's equation. So, e to the i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta. And you can always write cosines and sines as imaginary numbers. Um, if you are a physics major, you're going to be using that all the time because this is often a really easy shortcut um, to, to work with some of these ugly equations because it's easier to work with exponents than it is to remember all those stupid sine and cosine identities. So that's just a teaser for when you get to your upper level classes. If you are asked to show that the cosine or sine solution works, all that means is to take those, um, those numbers and plug them in and show that they solve, that, that they give you the right force. They solve the differential equation. Of course, most of you are concurrently in calculus right now, so you won't necessarily, I, I, in my class, I try not to assign too many of those problems. Um, Sometimes a couple in class where you can get a little bit of help. So this is um, this is more profound than I think you probably realize. I certainly, when I was a when I was in introductory physics, did not realize how applicable it was. But these oscillatory problems, where you have near equilibrium systems, come up all the time, and are actually a, a, in many of the frontiers of cutting edge physics. All right, so here you have the cosine. So that's going to tell you what your mass on a spring does. Um, and then if you have some phase shift, if it is a positive phase shift, it shifts it towards by phi in the negative direction. All right, now. We talked about a mass on a frictionless table, but let's say that instead you have your spring hung from the ceiling. Now you do not, ooh, that, well, okay, we'll go with it. It's an ugly drawing. This is physics, not art. Um, so here you have your mass hanging from the ceiling. Now, before your mass was hanging from the ceiling, if you just had a, the spring, the spring is going to be compressed. There, it, there is actually a force acting on that mass. We have gravity, and we have the force of the spring. So when you, um, and when you are in a system at equilibrium, then the um, the force of the, that means the net force is equal to zero, so the force of the spring has to exactly counteract the, um, it has to exactly counteract the force of gravity. Where we draw our coordinate system here matters. So if we put the zero of our y-axis at the equilibrium before the mass is added, then this is a shift in the negative y direction. Um, so we'll, so that shift is going to be, um, so that shift is the one that comes into our equation. So we have, because it's in equilibrium, we haven't started oscillations yet, the force, we're going to use it as a scalar instead of keep track of vector notation because I'm only dealing with motion in one dimension, so I can just say, well, it's the value of the force in the, extra, in the, um, in the y direction. So it's a negative m 
g plus, and then this is k, well, negative k times the displacement from equilibrium. So negative ky. Now I know our y is negative here, the way that we've described this, this system physically. If this force is equal to zero, we can solve to find out what that y is. y equals negative mg over k. So you get some displacement, which is set by the spring constant and the size of the mass. The heavier the mass, the more it is going to get stretched. The, um, and the stiffer the spring, a stiff spring has a larger spring constant k. The stiffer the spring, the less that it is going to stretch. Um, so when we talk about this system, this is where the definition of the coordinate system gets, um, it really matters. Uh, often, if I ask you to describe the position of the mass on the spring, um, the distance from the ceiling as opposed to the distance from equilibrium, a very, 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 very common mistake is that students will set the origin at the top of the ceiling and they will forget that there's that it's really this spring constant is valid for an offset from the ceiling. So if you want to um, if you want to be careful and describe where your coordinate system does not necessarily start at the equilibrium position, you can change this to a y minus y0, and then here you have a y0 there. But let me just flag this as an issue. This is one of the more common problems that students, common mistakes that students make. That also means that you actually can measure the spring constant uh, by measuring how much the spring um, stretches when you add the mass. Okay, so then you can look at the acceleration and the velocity um, and the displacement all as a function of time. And we actually know what these answers are um, because I've already told you the answer. Um, and I'm going to go, I'm going to continue using this notation with the dots because that's another notation that you're going to run into in physics classes. So on one hand, good to stick with the same notation. On the other hand, if you're watching, you're probably a physics major, and it's better to throw the notation at you now and get you used to it. Okay, x of t is a cosine omega t plus phi. The derivative, a x dot is negative a omega sine omega t plus phi x double dot, the second derivative is negative a omega squared cosine omega t plus phi. Now, what does this really mean? Okay, the displacement, when you have the displacement of the mass on, the, on a spring, when you are, let me draw our mass. When your mass is initially displaced, the displacement is large. The, um, if you're at your maximum displacement, your displacement is large, we're going to set phi equals to, equal to zero just to talk about qualitatively what happens. Um, so your displacement is largest when your mass is when you're uh, at the beginning, which means that your speed is slowest because the sine of zero is zero. And then your acceleration is largest. Now your acceleration is largest because when you're way out here at your maximum, that's when your displacement is largest. And your force, which is equal to mass times acceleration, is equal to negative k times the displacement. 
So when my displacement is largest, my force is, is largest, therefore my acceleration is largest. Here, I'm at the, the, if I am at the equilibrium position, then, um, then my force is zero because I have, uh, because there's no restoring force. I am at the equilibrium position. I'm not trying to get back to the, um, I'm, not, I'm not trying, getting pulled back to the equilibrium position. But now, my speed is highest. So, if I, I'm going to draw these plots bigger. Um, so, here, this is my position. And I go from positive A to negative A. My speed, let's try, well, let's say, my velocity is going to go from positive A omega to A omega. Initially, my velocity is zero, and then I start moving in the negative. Uh, I start, I have a negative. I'm, so if I'm out here, my velocity pushes me back, and then it slows down until it reaches zero. And then it, uh, now it's zero, but I'm here, I'm going in, let's see, here I have gone, I'm here, I go here, and I compress, and then I slow, I stop, and I turn around. The sign of my velocity changes. And uh, and then I uh, and then I come out here and I reach I reach my maximum um, I am at my maximum velocity in the other direction here, and then I continue until I turn around. My acceleration. Let me check colors. All right, my oh, and I wanted to write this as velocity. My acceleration is the same, it's, it's in phase with my position, but it's the negative. Okay, so. When I am here at the beginning, the force is, my displacement is largest, my acceleration is largest. As I move in here, my acceleration decreases, and my displacement is now zero. As soon as I pass that, the sign of my acceleration changes and my acceleration is constantly decreasing until I stop at the maximum displacement, and then it in, and then I have, uh, I have constant acceleration, uh, sorry, and then I accelerate here, so I'm speeding up until my displacement is zero. Now I have no acceleration right there. I turn around and I do it again. That's oscillatory motion. And if we talked about the same thing, we hang a mass, hang a mass instead of putting it on some frictionless table. You have the same thing physically, um, but instead of it sliding back and forth on a frictionless table, it's bouncing up and down from the, uh, hanging from the ceiling. That sounds like a good way to spend an afternoon. All right. So um, we can also talk about what happens to the energy. Um, so we've talked before about kinetic and potential energy. 
when you are at equilibrium, you have no potential energy. So when you're at the equilibrium position, you have no potential energy, but everything that you have is kinetic energy. So what's happening when you, um, when you go back and forth, when your spring oscillates like this, I'm going to draw my simple spring again. So when you are at the maximum amplitude, you have all potential energy, no kinetic energy. Come back in, and you have, as you come in, your potential energy is decreasing and your kinetic energy is increasing. You move here, your potential energy is increasing, your kinetic energy is decreasing. So the amount of kinetic and potential energy oscillates as the system goes back and forth. Um, and you can actually talk about quantifying that. So we're going to do that here. I'm going to start with these equations. So this is just um, our potential energy from a mass on a spring that we used before and our kinetic energy. And this equation got mangled, and I did not check it. This should actually be um, K equals 1 half mx dot squared. So this is the velocity. And what we're going to do is take our solution and plug this in and show that you actually do have the energy oscillating between the two forms. So we're going to start with our potential energy. So we need to look at x squared. So x squared of p is equal to a squared cosine squared omega t plus phi. Now, there's a few things that I can do with this, and I'm also going to write, I'm going to use my half angle formulas to write this as one half, so one half, or actually I can write this as a squared times one half, and then this is one plus cosine of 2 omega t plus phi. So here, I always, I always get these confused. So the way that I double check myself is that I make sure that when I put a zero in the argument, I get back the correct answer. So cosine of zero is one. So here, if I put a zero in here, uh, cosine of 2 times uh, 0 is 0, so I have a 1 here, so I have 1 plus 1, is, and then divided by 2 is 1, so I get back to a squared. Okay, so I chose the right sign there. I'm also going to use x dot squared, the velocity squared, and this is going to give me a squared omega squared sine squared omega t plus phi, and that is going to equal a squared omega squared over 2 times 1 minus cosine 2 omega t plus phi. And then we can do a few things with that. Okay, so a first thing to note, when we, uh, when we square a number, we should, never get, um, we should never get a zero when we're squaring, uh, we should never get a negative number when we're squaring, um, when we're squaring numbers that are not imaginary. Um, so here, this term, we have that the u potential energy is equal to one half k x squared. So that is a squared over four k one plus cosine two omega t plus phi. K 
is equal to a over 4, a squared over 4 omega squared, 1 plus cosine, or sorry, 1 minus cosine 2 omega t plus phi. So now what we can do is, so this, is all, this term is always going to oscillate between negative 1 and 1. So at its lowest point, this is going to be 0. Um, and at its highest point, this is going to be 2. This is going to do the same thing, but it's out of phase. I can actually, uh, so I'm going to plug in omega squared equals k over m. Ah, and I, I needed m v squared. I need, I dropped my m here. So I get for this amplitude a squared over 4 omega squared m is equal to a squared over 4. Now omega squared is k over m. So this is equal to a squared over 4 times k. So I get that the kinetic energy is equal to a squared over 4. Let's see. My, uh, <laughs> this should have been a k. Bear with me. The kinet, the, this is, x squared. This is the potential. This one should have been k with no m. This one should be omega squared. This one has an m. All right. So yes, this is a squared over 4 k 1 minus cosine 2 omega t plus phi. All right, now if I add my potential energy and my kinetic energy, what happens, since I have the same constant out in front here, is that these two terms cancel out. So my total energy, which is u plus k is equal to 2 times a squared over 4 k or a squared over 2 k. Now that also happens to be our maximum potential energy. So at its largest this is 1 plus 1, so this is 2 times a squared over 4k, or a squared over, a squared k over 2. So our maximum potential energy is equal to our total, uh, our total energy. Likewise, our maximum kinetic energy is equal to our total, um, our total energy. So what happens is that the, um, the energy in the system is constant, but the uh, distribution of the energy oscillates back and forth so that you, when you are at your maximum displacement, everything is potential energy. But then when you are at the equilibrium position, everything is kinetic energy. Um, and the energy is always positive. Um, potential energy is always positive. Kinetic energy is always positive. And it's just that the two types of energy are oscillating back and forth. And here you can see that plotted as a function of time um, so that the total energy is the red line. The total energy is constant. The potential energy shown here is the green line. That, uh, sorry, that's the kinetic energy is the green line. The potential energy is the yellow line. They oscillate back and forth, but the total energy stays the same. Um, so 
and then when you look at the individual components, the position is going positive and negative, the velocity is going positive and negative, but the sum of the energy is always positive. And here you can see zooming in, what's happening is that when you are at the, this is showing as a function of the displacement, when you are at your maximum displacement, all of your energy is potential. And when you are at your um, equilibrium position, all of, the, all of the energy is kinetic. And this is a point worth belaboring. Simple harmonic motion is everywhere. Much of physics actually is the study of simple harmonic motion. If you don't know, if you have some system which is bound or it is, and is vaguely near equilibrium, then you can describe oscillations about that equilibrium point as approximately simple harmonic motion. And then a lot of physics is, well, let's add slight corrections for this, that. Let's, let's look at how, um, how it deviates slightly from simple harmonic motion. But our first guess is simple harmonic motion. When in doubt, you can model everything as a mass on a screen. And it's usually a pretty good model. It's a great place to start. Um, and that, that maybe is, is worth a brief philosophical aside. Often when you're taking physics in high school, um, it seems as if we're just giving you correct descriptions of the universe. We are telling you, this is the way the world works. Here is the equation that describes everything. It seems very deterministic. It seems like you actually understand everything. But really, you can only describe things mathematically exactly in a very finite number of cases. And every other time, we are modeling the world with equations. We're making a guess or an approximation, which is an educated guess. Um, and we are not describing things exactly. We are saying, let's make these assumptions. And then if you do that, then you can describe the system like this. And then let's test that assumption. Let's see how well that assumption really describes the world. Uh, so all of physics, uh, intro physics, is often about describing exact solutions. And the rest of physics is where you go from there and how you describe approximate solutions. So here, let's start by, um, if you are still taking calculus, you maybe haven't quite hit this. Um, we talk about a stable equilibrium point. A mass and a spring is an example where you have a stable equilibrium point. As soon as you are slightly displaced from the equilibrium position, then you get pushed back towards equilibrium. So a mass on a spring, the spring force is a stable equilibrium. The, um, you can have another example, which is if you imagine um, you set a marble on top of another ball. If you get it just right, it might stay there. But if the marble starts to roll a little bit, the net force is out as away from the equilibrium position. If there's a slight displacement from equilibrium, then the system tends to, um, tends to be unstable. This is, so this is an unstable equilibrium point. And you also can have something where like maybe it's a marble rolling down a hill and there's a very small flat spot and so you have an unstable equilibrium. Going in one direction, it pushes it towards the equilibrium point. Going the other direction, you know, past the equilibrium point, it pushes it away. These types of stable equilibrium points, this is important for understanding when you can apply a, the model of a mass on a spring or some type of oscillatory motion as a model of the physical world. When you have stable equilibrium points, then you can get close to, then usually describing something as a mass on a spring, that's not a bad model. It's a really good first guess. In these other two cases, you're not talking, you don't have stable equilibrium points, so the, you, you can't really describe things as a mass on a spring. Now here, we can talk about this in terms of the, um, in terms of 
the potential energy. So here you see a potential where it looks like a well. So you know, if you imagine a marble rolling down the rolling in this area, then it is um, the marble would be contained. So this could be a bowl that could hold a marble. So if you drop the marble here, woo, woo, it's going to oscillate, but it will stay in the bowl. You can't keep a, a marble in something like this. Now, the it turns out, and and it turns out that you can describe the force as the derivative of the potential energy, is the negative derivative of the potential energy. So um, your force, when you have a potential like this, the derivative of your potential energy is positive. So here, the derivative is, sorry, the negative derivative is positive. So here, the derivative is negative. The slope is down. Um, the slope of the line at this point is down. So the slope is negative, but the negative derivative is positive. So the force will point in this direction. Here, the opposite is true. The slope is positive, so your derivative is that in that direction, so your negative derivative is negative, which means that the force pushes the object back towards the origin. And if you want to, um, if you want to describe the potential, so you can always take something called the Taylor series. So this is another one of those asides for a little bit more calculus. Feel free to breeze past this. You can always take a Taylor series of something. So I can always write the potential as approximately a constant plus the uh, let me actually, I can always write the, I can always write this as the potential at zero, if I'm expanding about the origin, I can always write it as the potential at the origin plus the derivative at, as a function of um, position, in this case, times x plus the second derivative as a function of x. Note I'm not using the double dot here because this is not a time derivative. Times 1 half x squared. Now, if I have a potential well, I can always choose to set this constant equal to 0. And at the very bottom of the well, so if I set my origin, at the bottom of the well, the derivative is equal to zero. So, oh, and then here, the Taylor series would say plus higher order terms. If I have, uh, um, so if I have any type of, um, of potential that has a minimum at the origin, I can always describe it as approximately some constant times x squared. Well, this is just our equation for the potential for a mass on a spring. A Taylor series is universally true for reasonably smooth functions that behave nicely, which is every, almost everything that we deal with in the physical world. So I can always approximate any bound system as approximately a mass on a spring. Life is a mass on a spring. And as one of my students once said, then you derive. <laughs> um, so you always, you always can describe some bound system as a mass on a spring. Uh, even if you didn't follow the math at this point, at least take home the message. Any bound system is approximately a mass on a spring. So if you know nothing else other than that the system is bound, it is approximately a mass on a spring. And whatever you look up, whether you're talking about physical chemistry or 
some application of mechanical engineering, this placement of a bridge when, you, when soldiers are marching past on the bridge, you know, whatever application you're talking about, if the system is, if, if there's some equilibrium position, you're dealing with small perturbations from that, you can always start by describing it as a mass on a spring. That's really deep. That, that's, I, I think that's just incredibly deep and very important. So here you can see an example of that application where you can describe the potential energy between two atoms. And if you dig in close, it's actually really, um, it, it actually can be, it's complicated. So here, the behavior is nothing like a mass on a spring, but if you have this equilibrium, you know, you have some equilibrium position, which means that you have a minimum, you can expand the potential about that minimum and always describe it as a mass on a spring. That's really cool. So what you're doing now is really applicable, even if it seems like it's esoteric and you're just talking about some mass on a spring. When do you ever hook a mass up to a spring and just watch it oscillate? Time. All right, so now we're going to move on to comparisons to circular motion. So um, it turns out that we can actually model simple harmonic motion as it's very it's related to circular motion. So for instance, if you have a peg on a wheel and the peg is rotating and you shine light down on it, the shadow from the peg will move back and forth on the ground um, with, a, with simple harmonic motion. Um, that's actually related to um, if you have uh, if you have a vector, um, if you have say the hand on a clock, rotating and you are always looking at its um, position, its displacement in the, say, x direction here, then you're always going to have a projection which is um, the x position is going to be the maximum x position cosine of theta, the angle that it makes with the axis, so if you're rotating at constant speed and theta is, a, is changing constantly, then the x position will be the maximum amplitude co cosine omega t. So that can help you if you're struggling with thinking of analogs for what's going on here. And you can uh, you can expand that and uh, and talk about what happens if you as you shine the light down as your peg is rotating, and the math works out to be exactly the same as if you have a mass on a spring or um, something moving with circular motion. And then we can take this and also apply this to pendulums. Uh, so. If you have a pendulum, then you want to draw the, um, and you draw the free body diagram, you have two forces on the pendulum. You have weight, um, and you have the, um, the tension in the string. And we're going to draw our coordinate system here with x um, going perpendicular to the string and y going aligned up with the string. We're only going to consider small angles relative to the um, small angle displacements relative to the vertical. So then you can dis you can break the using this coordinate system. You can break the weight into its components, and the weight is then given by the by m g, and then negative cosine theta in the y hat direction and positive, or sorry, it's the way it's written, also a negative mg sine theta. Let me write this where you can actually see it. So we can write that the weight is a couple misses there. The weight 
is equal to negative mg cosine theta uh, y hat minus mg sine theta x hat. Um, so your force in this case, when you're up here, the force is restoring. It is going to push the pendulum back towards equilib equilibrium. You can also draw the mirror image. And I think that's useful to think about. So now here, your weight is still pointing exactly down. Um, and your tension in the string is in this direction. Um, so now your restoring force is actually in this direction. So when your, um, when your pendulum bob is over here, it gets pushed back towards equilibrium. When it is over here, it gets pushed back towards equilibrium as well. Um, and now we can get this, or we can go back to um, the equation that we had before. Um, and let's see, here, if you want to, uh, so that's how we can write the weight and then the, um, we want to get this in the same form as our mass on a spring. So here we're going to write this displacement. So what this displacement, we're going to use S. That's the arc length. So the arc length is equal to the radius times the angle. Um, and for small angles, S and X are approximately equal um, because for small angles, this is approximately flat. So then I can write my force equation, F, equals m times the second derivative of x. And this is equal to m times the, uh, we'll write this as d L theta dt, now the length is constant, so this is m l d theta dt. Now here, I am going to use, I already mentioned the Taylor series in this lecture, you can always write a function as, uh, as, some, as some function so for, let me actually write the general equation for a Taylor series. A Taylor series is, F, is the function at, at a given value plus that fun function's first derivative evaluated at that point times x minus x naught plus one half times the second derivative with respect to x, x minus x naught quantity squared. So it turns out that for a sine function close to zero, this term is zero and this term is zero. So sine of theta is approximately equal to theta. So now I can say that the net, so my net force on this pendulum, the tension in the string cancels out the weight along the y-axis, but the tension in the string can only act in, uh, along the string. So I have a restoring force, which is perpendicular to that. Um, so my net force, that's where I get that my net force is uh, negative mg sine theta x hat 
And so my net force is m l d theta, or is approximately equal to m l d theta d t, and that is equal to negative, or sorry, and m l d. This should be the second derivative. Sorry about that. And this is equal to negative m g, or approximately equal to negative m g theta. So here, my m's cancel out. And I get, I can rearrange this and write this as the second derivative of the angle plus g over l times the angle equals 0. And we can make a direct analog between the, that and the equation that we had for a mass on a spring. These two equations have the same form. So theta is going to have the same solution, except that for a simple pendulum, the angular frequency is the square root of g, the gravitational constant g, divided by l. So that is this equation here. This is our answer for a simple pendulum. A simple pendulum is one where um, the, there is only one ball. You don't have an extended object. Um, and you guys will likely do this in, uh, do a lab based on this. Now this is also roughly how um, old style grandfather clocks work, that that pendulum, because the angular frequency only depends on the length um, and it is constant, that pendulum will move with a roughly, um, roughly constant period. And it doesn't depend on the amplitude. So if you start that grandfather clock, if you start the pendulum swinging back and forth, it's going to keep the same period um, for roughly, well, until it stops because there is some damping of the motion, but they design grandfather clocks so that there's minimal damping. And it's going to keep going with the same period forever. So that's how the, so a pendulum can actually be used as a clock. Now, of course, it is always an approximation that you have a mass only on the end of a massless string. So you can do this problem as well, but instead of, um, instead of having a simple pendulum, you have an extended object. In that case, what you can use is the, um, you can actually use uh, a few different ways of, of deriving it. You end up, you can use either your oscillatory motion so that you're considering the, the torque and the, um, the angular acceleration, or you, um, or you can consider the force acting only on the center of mass. Um, and the answer is this, that you end up with the angular frequency equals the mass times, the, times g times l over the moment of inertia. Now, we can show that that's equal to a simple pendulum. So for a simple pendulum, the moment of inertia is simply m l squared. So if we plug that in for the moment of inertia here, uh, you get m g l over m l squared in your square root. And you get cancellations. You get that the oscillation frequency is g over the square root of g over l. So this equation for a we call this the physical pendulum because a physical pendulum doesn't just have a single mass at the very end. Um, and that reduces to the case of a simple pendulum when you consider the simple pendulum to just be a bob on the end of a string and use that moment of inertia. So the same basic principle. And either way, the, um, the angular frequency is completely independent of the displacement, so it works as a good um, means of keeping time. Now, we can add complications to this, um, to the simple harmonic motion. So we saw that you get this term from force, and this is from 
the restoring force from the spring. If you have damped oscillations, then, um, then you end up with, uh, and actually this should not have an F, the damped oscillations should just, um, should, you have the second derivative equals some constant plus the velocity plus, the, um, plus a constant times the displacement. So, uh, so here, this is your damping term, and this is, damping terms are often roughly proportional to the velocity, that the faster something's moving, the more that it slows down. So we have this modification to our equation for simple harmonic motion, and this turns out to have this solution. I will leave it as an exercise for the student to show that that is, in fact, the solution. And then when you do that, then you get a slight correction to the angular frequency um, so that the, um, the damping does, in fact, impact the angular frequency slightly. That is also left as an exercise for the student. When you take differential equations, you will see, you, you will work on deriving that exactly. So what happens when you consider damping, an example of how you might have damping is that you have this mass on a spring. Now, either really in air, if you have a mass on a spring oscillating in air, it is going to damp somewhat because we never have a system without any damping. But um, you can get damping to, you can get more damping by having your spring oscillate inside of a liquid such as water. Um, and when you have, so when you have that damping, um, because of the viscosity of water, you are going, the, the water is going to slow down the mass on a spring. And what happens if we toggle back and forth, our equation here says that there's, uh, that the, the, um, x of t is a e to the negative b over 2 m t cosine omega t plus some phase shift. So this is our solution. And you have this envelope from the cosine of, or from the e to the negative t that you can think of as changing the amplitude of the oscillation, but you still have the oscillations themselves. Um, and if you have only a little bit of damping, this omega is going to be approximately equal to the omega that you had before without damping. And as I said, this happens in a real pendulum, even if you're doing this in air, it's just that the, uh, the damping is slower. Um, here you can see this zoomed in. This is showing the envelope of the exponentially decreasing amplitude around the oscillations themselves. And you have three different, um, three different si situations that you can have. Um, one is if, the, um, if you have something which, uh, um, if we go back to... Um, here, uh, when you have, um, if you have very weak damping, you will see the oscilla oscillations like we had. This is this weak damping. That is because um, your omega is equal to k, the square root of k over m minus b squared over the b, b squared over 4m. So if you're, so here's our omega. If you have a very, very weak damping, um, and this is, or at least this is non, um, this term is less than that, you will get, if you have this term is less than that term, you will have a positive omega and you will see some oscillations. Um, you reach something called critical damping if the argument is equal to zero. So that argument is equal to zero when this is true. Um, so that turns out to be b squared equals 4m. Uh, this should be m squared. b squared equals 4mk. So that's called critical damping. And for instance, when you have uh, um, when you have shock absorbers on your car, 
that is what you want. You want it to damp out the oscillations, but not too fast. Um, so that you, so that if you're riding in the car, you have a rather smooth, slow deceleration. The other um, case that you have is, um, is the last one where uh, the damping is very large. Um, and that is going to mean that, so that would happen if B squared is greater than, B squared over 4M is greater than K over M. For, so in that case, you can rearrange this. You get that B squared has to be less than, I have the, the less than in the wrong spot. B squared is less than 4MK. Um, when that is the case, you have critical, or sorry, when that is the case, you have very large damping, and it immediately attempts to return to the, um, to the equilibrium position. So it's not even really, it never even reaches oscillations in either of the latter two cases. Okay, another application is forced oscillations. So in that case, um, and again, I, so you are applying some force, uh, F equals should not be there. So your equation here, instead of equaling zero, is equal to whatever force you are applying. And when that happens, you have the same form of a solution, except that now you have an amplitude which depends on, so I want to denote, now we've added a subscript zero for our equilibrium, um, our equilibrium uh, angular frequency in the absence of damping and in the absence of a driven force. And then um, the amplitude is, depends on this big ugly mess. Now, and we'll talk about what that mess does. Okay. So if you, examples where you might have a driving force are you have a yo-yo and, and fortunately um, I'm a physicist so I only have to describe how it works. I don't actually have to do it because I've never really been able to, <laughs> I've never been able to use a yo-yo. But if you have a yo-yo, when you are um, swinging your finger back and forth, you are uh, providing that um, applied force, and that is in fact the force that causes the yo-yo to go up and down. Uh, and this is this is a paddle on a ball. You're providing some force, and that's how you can get oscillations. Um, you could also do this by, um, in this case, moving your mass on a spring up and down um, inside of the fluid, so you've got damping from the fluid. Um, but the rotation is actually driving the oscillation. And what happens is that you get something called resonance, um, where if your driving frequency is very close to the, the natural frequency, um, where here, now this is in terms of frequency, not angular frequency, but our natural angular frequency is the square root of k over m. So the closer your driving frequency is to that um, natural frequency, the higher the amplitude is. So we had this big, ugly mess. So if we want the amplitude high, we want this term to be small. And the fact that there's damping is what keeps this going from infinity to infinity. If you didn't have damping, then in principle, your amplitude could go into infinity. Any real physical system has at least some damping. So then you can plot that amplitude, and as you change your driving frequency, as you get closer and closer to the natural frequency, the amplitude shoots way, way up. And if you have heavy damping, it's not going to shoot up as much. Um, and if you, have, uh, if you have little damping, then it's going to shoot up further. So that correction term um, let me write that, uh, that amplitude down here so we can look at it. It is A, uh, F, F naught, and then uh, the square root of, I think it was M squared. Let me just write it here. M squared 
omega squared minus omega naught squared plus b squared omega squared. Okay, so if I have very large damping, this term becomes very large. That's making this term larger. And there will always be some bump when you get close to the natural frequency. Um, the smaller, if you have small damp damping, that bump is very large. If you have um, large damping, that bump is very small. Um, this leads to something called resonance. Resonance is an incredibly useful um, application. So for instance, if you have, um, I probably didn't want to erase that, so we're going to go ahead and write that down again. The amplitude is the m, it's m squared omega squared minus omega naught squared plus b squared omega squared square root. So um, if you have some system that has a resonance frequency, so anything that has some equilibrium position and it can move, then you can actually drive that system and make it oscillate if you are close to the resonance frequency. So one of the classic uh, examples, and you should go look up this YouTube video because it's quite impressive, is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. So the Tacoma Narrows, you know, now they should have known better even then, but to the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was um, built without, cons without allowing damping and without having features that help damp the resonances. So what happened was that, this, that the wind got blowing um, in the, uh, over the um, little valley where they had this bridge, and it got blowing at just the right frequency, and it was close to the natural frequency of the bridge. So it drove the bridge, and you can see the bridge start shaking, and it actually, the, the, now we're talking a solid cement bridge, and this thing just got galloping and moving back and forth. Unfortunately, it did so when there were cars on the bridge. Now, the only casualty was a dog who was trapped in a car, and someone tried to rescue him, and he tried to bite them, and the dog actually drowned. Fortunately, there were no people drowned. But that, fe that feature where these bridges can have these natural resonances turns out to be very common, and it also can happen if you have armies, for instance, armies marching over bridges. Um, they, they break cadence, so normally mar armies march with in step, meaning that everybody is moving their feet at the same time. Well, this actually has happened in real battles historically, that the entire army marched in step across the bridge, and it was close to the natural frequency of the bridge, and it got to the point where it was driving those oscillations high enough that the bridge fell apart. Now, if you're an army moving across the bridge, the last thing that you want is for that bridge to fall apart and you, you know, your soul, own soldiers die. So to this day, armies break cadence crossing the bridge, but also we do try to build bridges so that it is harder to reach these natural frequencies. One of my favorite examples of, of resonance re and how resonance can be useful to you, um, when my father was an undergraduate and in the freshman dormitories, there was, his upstairs neighbor liked to play the music particularly loud, and it kept everybody up at night. Now, fortunately, he played it loud enough that he could not hear what other people were doing, and so one of his downstairs neighbors took a speaker. Now, a speaker, if you disconnect the wires and, and just apply a, frequent, a voltage directly, it is actually a tunable, um, it provides a tunable source of, um, a tunable source of sound where you can change the frequency by changing the, um, the voltage and the, the frequency of the um, voltage that you apply to the speaker. So you can tune the, the pitch. And you can do this if, so what my, uh, what happened in my father's dorm when he was a freshman is that someone took a speaker, put it up against the wall, used it as a tunable frequency source, and changed it until it hit the natural frequency of the wall. And the guy uh, playing the loud radio had a big shelf of books over his bed. 
um, and it caused the shelf of books to vibrate and dump all the books on the guy. They did this once. The guy stopped playing his music so loud. Now, he didn't know that his neighbors had done this because he was playing his music so loud that he did not hear this tunable frequency source. Um, so, physics can be useful in your life. A less fun application from when I was an undergrad is that we had a eh, poorly built apartment um, that I lived in um, with my brother and my brother's friend, Ted. And the washing machine, if it was imperfectly balanced, it would get rotating um, when it was in the spin cycle and it would vibrate. It vibrated at the natural frequency of the wall. So if you got that, if you were doing laundry and it hit the spin cycle, it would just shake and it would make the whole house rotate, vibrate. It was pretty bad. On the other hand, because it was not designed to have, um, it was not designed to oscillate. So all you had to do was move the washing machine ever so slightly and um, it no longer managed to, you know, the natural frequency near that point of the, where the, the legs hit the ground was no longer quite the same. It didn't, it, there was much more damping in that part of the floor and it no longer rotated the, um, the it no longer caused the entire wall to vibrate. So resonance, resonance is useful to you. It's a, it, it also comes up um, with other applications, such as when you start talking about um, molecules and um, what causes things to oscillate. You, you know, the, the places where molecules absorb light is where you hit the resonances. So resonance, much of many fields of science deals with resonances. Um, which are all when you end up driving the system close to its natural frequency. And note as well, you don't have to hit exactly the natural frequency, you just have to get close. Um, we then want to define, we can define the quality of the system. So you have this, uh, this Q factor. The quality of a system describes how sharp of a resonance that is. And so we define this Q factor as the natural frequency divided by the um, full width at half max. So what that means is that if your, so here is your amplitude and the maximum amplitude is here. Or sorry, here's the, the amplitude goes from zero up to six, so half of the maximum is three of these little squares. So how wide is it at three of these squares? That's the full width at half maximum. Um, and so omega naught over delta Q, that describes the quality of the resonance. The more damping, the lower quality resonance. This Q factor is used all in all sorts of places for any resonance. So when, I, when it comes up, for instance, is that we have um, radio wave cavities either, if you're talking about nuclear magnetic resonance, which is used all the time in biology, or for instance, I, my research is at an accelerator and they have um, radio frequency cavities for driving the accelerator. So you have a quality factor for that cavity and you can actually directly measure it by looking at the amplitude of oscillations as a function of the frequency, um, and you measure the quality of that, um, that cavity um, using this equation. So um, for something like that, where you are trying to get resonance, you're trying to get your waves to stay in that cavity, um, a lower quality factor cavity is going to lose energy faster um, you won't get such good resonances. That's when you want a high Q factor. But there are times, for instance, when you talk about a bridge and you're, you don't want your bridge to oscillate, you actually want to design something that has a low quality factor. Um, so now we will move on to a few examples. I only have a handful of examples here. Um, prove uh, prove that you get the same results for, um, uh, for the period of the oscillations for a mass and a spring with a cosine and a sine. So now we are going to use our equation mx double dot 
plus kx equals 0, x equals a sine omega t plus phi, the first derivative is a positive a omega cosine omega t plus phi, and the second derivative is a negative a omega squared sine omega t plus phi. This is negative omega squared times x. So this is our trial solution. We're going to plug it back in here. m omega squared x plus kx equals 0. Now, again, I have the trivial answer that x equals 0, but that's not an interesting answer. So we're going to look for other solutions. And the other solutions have m omega squared plus k equals 0, or, uh, let's see, ah, here I should have a negative sign, negative m omega squared plus k equals 0, so here I get omega squared equals k over m, or omega equals the square root of k over m. So that was a nice little one. There you're showing that the, um, the answer is the same. And you also could show the same, um, you could also use, the, use trigono trigonometric identities to show that you can write a sine as a cosine with a phase shift. OK, a mass m is attached to a spring and hung vertically. Um, the mass is raised a short distance in the vertical direction, and uh, it is released. It oscillates with a frequency f. If the mass is replaced with a mass nine times as large, and the experiment was repeated, what would be the frequency of oscillations in terms of f? OK, what we know here is omega equals the square root of k over m. And here, I'm going to write this omega naught and m naught. Omega is also equal to 2 pi f naught. Now, our second, our, our omega later is going to have 9 times the mass. So this is k over 9 m naught. And this has to equal to 2 pi f. Now, here, this is equal to one third k over m naught, which is equal to one third omega naught, which is equal to two. So I'm going to plug in omega naught equals two pi f naught. So this is 2 pi f, uh, let me put the equal sign where everybody can read it, equals to 2 pi f naught over 3. 2 pi f equals 2 pi f naught over 3. And um, the frequency, my two pi's cancel out. So the overall frequency is one third what it was.
So it will, the frequency is inversely proportional to the period. So the frequency will be less, the period will be greater. So it's going to take an oscillation longer when you have a larger mass. Okay, so that's a simple problem where we just take everything we know. And I want to highlight that here those basic definitions are coming up. Those basic definitions are going to come up a lot, and you will find yourself using them over and over again. As I said, I'm not a big fan of memorization, but this is one of those cases that is an exception where it's actually useful to memorize because it's going to come up over and over again. All right. It's way in time for the local under 85 kilograms rugby team. I, I, I used to play rugby. I, have, I don't recall an under 85 kilogram team, but we'll go with it. The bathroom scale used to assess eligibility can be described by Hooke's law and is depressed by 0.75 centimeters at its maximum uh, by by its maximum load of 120 kilograms. What that means by saying that it's the maximum load is that you shouldn't get on that scale if you weigh more than 120 kilograms because it might break. All right, so we have. Uh, if you have someone on a scale, using my artistic abilities, such as they are, here you have, uh, you can think of this as a person standing directly on a spring, and there is the normal force of the, so the force of the spring is acting up and the force of gravity is acting down. So the, um, this is at equilibrium and I am going to draw my coordinate system with Y up. So here our net force, and I'm going to drop the vector sign because we're talking about motion in one dimension, and a good physicist is a lazy physicist. So here, our net force is kx minus mg. The force of the spring from the spring scale has to exactly count, and that has to equal zero because it has to exactly counteract um, the force of so there has to be, the system has to be at equilibrium once the scale has reached its reading. So what you are told is you are given, um, so part A, what is the, the spring's effective force constant? So what is K? So K is equal to mg over the displacement. And here I'm going to put knots in there. Um, to denote that, uh, that this is the initial displacement from part A, because later it's going to come in handy. And this is, e this is so a, a load of 120 kilograms. So 120 kilograms times 9. I'm going to actually leave that one as G, um, because I don't want to uh, work with ugly numbers later, and then this is three quarters of a centimeter, so 10 to the negative two um, meters. And that is going to be equal to four times 120 times 10 to the two divided by three kilograms per meter G. Now let's check units real quickly. Kilograms per meter times meters per second squared gives me units of kilograms per second squared. That times, uh, times a displacement in meters should give me units of force, and it does. 
So these are funny units, but I'm going to stick with them because they work. 12 divided by 3 is 4, so I have 16 times 10 to the third. So I'm going to write that as 1.6 times 10 to the fourth. Um, just if you're tracking the, um, well, let's see, here I have four, yeah, I have an extra or, order of 10 and that, yeah, yep. So 1.6 times 10 to the fourth in units of kilogram meters, kilograms per meters times G. And then a, for part B, so this is part A, for part B, a player stands on the scales and it is depressed by 0.48 centimeters. Is he eligible to play on this team? So uh, here, we now, so before we were given the mass and the, um, the displacement and asked to find the spring constant. Now it's the same equation here, except we are given the displacement and the spring constant and asked to find the mass. So here I'm going to solve this and get that the mass is uh, equal to k x naught divided by g. Now my k is 1.6 times 10 to the fourth. Now that's a very large spring constant, but that makes sense because um, if your scale is, is, um, can be deflected by three quarters of a centimeter, that's a lot for your, spring, your scale to be deflected. Um, 10 to the 1.6 times 10 to the fourth kilograms per meters times G divided by G and then times 0.48. So here, I am going to um, write this uh, 0.48, ah, but it's centimeters. So I have 4.8 times 10 to the negative 3 meters. And I am going to actually write this um, as 5 minus 0.2 times 10 to the negative 3 meters. So now I have 16 times 5 minus 0.2 kilograms. And I'm going to see if I have to calculate that extra correction. So 5 times 16 is 80. This is 80 kilograms minus this is 1. So 1 tenth is 1.6. So this is 3.2 kilograms. So that is definitely under 85 kilograms, and this player can play. Maybe that's a thing uh, elsewhere in the world. The two rugby teams that I played on were women's rugby teams, and 85 kilograms is uh, quite a lot. There were, n there were never... I don't think even on, I don't think we had women on who were 85 kilograms. Um, well, we must have. No, actually, we probably did have some women who were 85 kilograms. But if, if you played women's rugby, if you limited it to some women, you might not have enough players to make a team. We used to have three teams of sevens in Colorado. And, if, <laughs> and you had to play one of them. We played each other all the time. All right, now, a pendulum on a cuckoo clock is five centimeters long. What is its frequency? Now, here, I want to point out, read the question carefully. One of the most common problems, one of the most common mistakes that intro physics students make is a reading comprehension error. 
frequency is not angular frequency. Your angular frequency is the square root of k over, or sorry, for a pendulum, is the square root of g over l. And now for the, that is equal to 2 pi times the frequency. So your frequency itself is 1 over 2 pi times the square root of g over l. Um, and so the way that you would do this here is, and I'm not going to plug the numbers in, 9.8 meters per second squared divided by 5 times 10 to the negative 2 meters. Our units cancel out, so we are left with 1 over seconds squared. Um, and that is, and you take the square root, you're left with units of 1 over seconds. That is the correct unit for frequency. So we get the right answer. Let's see how far we can go without a calculator. 1 over 2 pi is about 1 over 6. And then here we have roughly 10 divided by 5 is 2 over, well, it's the square root of 2, and then here I can pull a t the, the square root of 10 to the negative 2 is 10 is to the negative 1. So I have one roughly the square root of 2 over 60. Um, the square root of 2 is roughly 1.4, so I have roughly 1.4 over 60, 15 over 60 is 1 quarter, and this is 1 tenth of that, so this is about 0 0.025. And then I have to have my units of inverse seconds. So a few things there. This one is simple plug and chug if you get it set up correctly. Do be careful to read the problem carefully so that you uh, answer, so that you give me the frequency and not the angular frequency. Um, and then I also would like to point out some of these tricks that I'm doing for calculating without a calculator. Those are useful things even if you don't, strictly speaking, need it um, for physics. It can be helpful if you're checking your answers, but it also can be helpful when you find yourself without a calculator, um, which is quite often. All right, um, then re reciprocating motion uses the rotation of a motor to produce a linear motion up and down or back and forth. Um, so you have something which oscillates and then uh, you have something, you have a rod connected to some, for instance, saw blade, and it's, it goes back and forth, it's going to push the saw blade back and forth. Um, so if you have um, the motor oscillating, um, it, the motor oscillates at 60 hertz, and um, you want to know the maximum speed of the saw blade as it moves left and right. Okay, so if we describe, we want to describe the x position. The x position is um, some maximum amplitude. Well, let me stick with A, like in the book. Cosine omega t plus, we'll just set the phi equal to zero for this case because um, we only care about the frequency, so we'll choose to set it to zero because it makes life easier. You're given that the frequency is 60 hertz, so the angular frequency is 2 pi f, which is 120 times pi. Um, and that gives you the x position, so that gives you the angular frequency, the derivative of the x position, which is the speed, is a times omega c 
sine is a negative sine omega t. Okay, so now this amplitude is 3 centimeters. Um, so the maximum speed dx dt, the maximum, the magnitude of the maximum speed is equal to a omega. And this is equal to 3 times 10 to the negative 2 meters. Uh, and this has units hertz, this has units of hertz or per second um, times 120 pi hertz. This is 1.2 times 10 to the 2. So I can write this as 1.2. So 3 times 10 to the negative 2 times 1.2 times 10 to the 2 times pi is equal to 3 times 1.2 times pi, or the 0.2 is going to give me, so this is 3.6 pi meters per second. If we want to put a number in, we can approximate, so pi is a, is a little bit more than 3, so we have roughly 3 by 3, but it's a little more than 3. So it is around 10 meters per second. This is when I had my approximation at that very last step. All right. So here I hope you're seeing oscillations are useful in your daily life. Um, they come up all the time. And even if you do not continue with physics, I hope that you will find ways to draw this important topic into your life. And with that, we will close our discussion of oscillations. Thank you.